getting awful hard to buy the right kind of charcoal for real good barbecue. 1,500 barbecues here. Probably half of them are brawling steaks tonight. <laughs> Let's play okay. another game. Bye-bye. Bill sure has a way with kids. Yeah, she's just a big kid herself. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Wendy Gonzalez, who is the CEO of Samasource, a platform for training data for machine learning algorithms. Welcome to the show today. Thanks, Scott. Good to be here. Yes, thank you. So Samasource is actually pretty well known, even in, within the kind of the mainstream, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about what the company does. Sure. So we provide uh, training data and data preparation solutions to some of the world's largest companies. We power um, companies like Walmart and Google and helping them bring their machine learning models to production. Terrific. Thank you for that. Um, now, again, like I mentioned before, uh, Samasource has been in the media for many years, and I think uh, many of us have come across it at some point in time. And I think a lot of that is attributed to uh, the founder, Leela Jenna, um, and just her media presence and her storytelling aspects. Uh, for those listeners that are not aware, uh, Leela, of course, has passed away early this year due to complications from a rare soft tissue cancer. Um, and I'm sure this has been a, a kind of a, you know, very difficult time for the organization. Uh, you have been a friend and a longtime colleague uh, of hers. Uh, you've uh, transitioned from COO, interim CEO, and then now taking on the permanent position of CEO by the time this episode comes out. Um, what can you share about this kind of you know, experience for you personally, but also the organization and the transition. And the second follow-up question to that is, what investor and market expectations did you have to overcome? Great questions. So I'll start from the uh, from the beginning. Uh, yes, it was uh, and has been an incredibly tragic um, passing of Lila. She um, was incredibly bright star and force in this universe. So. Um, yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been really challenging from that perspective as we worked um, incredibly closely day to day for for over five years. Um, but I'll, I'll maybe bring us back a little bit further. So uh, I joined in 2015. Uh, Lila founded Sama Source in 2008. And actually, when I joined, it's a pretty interesting story. At that point in time, um, Sama Source was founded as a nonprofit, uh, and that's because um, Sama Source was founded on a social mission. Uh, basically, Lila had a, a very strong belief um, that you know talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not. And by taking the approach of purposeful hiring in underserved communities, you could alleviate poverty. You could lift people out of poverty through that action of giving work and financial independence as opposed to charity or aid. Um, the entire premise was built on having a commercial model to where you know, you could sell contracts to to companies, um, perform some human judgment services, and and then um, as a result, be able to employ people and um, employ them at living wages. So it's very different than minimum wage, but living wage meaning you can support a family of four and effectively break the poverty cycle. So uh, when I um, so it was founded as a nonprofit because, as you can imagine, um, traditional investments were kind of like, hmm, <laughs> you know, this is kind of an interesting idea. You want to purposely hire these communities. Uh, so it was actually launched as a nonprofit. And when I joined, I came on board to basically run that impact sourcing business. And my objective in working with Lila was to transform us um, into a scalable business basically. So my job was to move us out of grant funding into fully earned revenue and to basically build a business that we could scale. So she and I worked um, really hand in hand, um, making that focus and transition. And that's really, um, at the time, you know, it became pretty clear to me coming in because I had only had sort of corporate 
background um, prior to this and startup background um, is that uh, we did really well at computer vision, specifically in training data. Um, there, at that time, we had already been working with companies like Google and Microsoft to um, feed their machine learning models. So we, for example, helped on the Xbox, um, helping you know uh, ensure that the, the gaming system was accurate by providing structured training data. Um, so we put all of our energy into really basically building our platform um, and from that platform that's always been, you know, sort of cloud, cloud based, basically, and, and um, high availability, we put all of our energy into building um, capabilities for training data. And so that was kind of the first major transition, is we put all of our energy into that. And, you know, within a couple of years, we were a profitable nonprofit. And from there, we, you know, we knew that not only with the growth of our business, there was growth of impact. So um, in the 2018, uh, basically, as summer of 2018, um, we initiated a transition to a for-profit. So that was a really interesting transition. And shortly, um, shortly thereafter, we went on to raise our Series A. So um, Lila and I had quite the journey together to go through um, everything from really building this into a very focused and scalable business, um, you know, multiple delivery centers, um, you know, a four nines availability platform. And uh, in after we uh, um, completed our Series A, uh, she was diagnosed with this incredibly rare and aggressive form of cancer. Um, it was, uh, honestly, Scott, it was such a strange time to be like kind of on the top of the world, seeing this, you know, mission and the subject fulfilled and then finding out her news. So shortly thereafter, as we transitioned, um, she and I worked closely on basically uh, taking that raise money to continue to enhance the platform um, to really build a number of, you know, machine learning assisted capabilities so that we could make our, you know, training data as efficient as possible. And, um, you know, we worked together very closely until she got to a point to where she needed to, to take some time off for, for medical. And um, sadly, I mean, this is a one in 10 million kind of cancer um, situation. It came on very aggressively. And as you know, she and I were working, you know, in sort of November, December, um, um, sadly, by January, it kind of caught us all by surprise, but she, um, she'd passed from her battle. So um, that was just this year. And you know, on, on the heels of, uh, of, of working through um, that grief, because it's obviously not only a loss of a business partner, but you know, I used to joke with my husband, he's like, you know, who do you talk to more, Lila or me? <laughs> I'm like, actually, probably Lila, because we spoke together and chatted pretty much, you know, every day for five years plus, countless trips, you know, countless um, dialogues. So yeah, it was, it was really tough. Um, personally, um, she's not anybody who can ever be replaced. Um, an incredible force, not just a storyteller, but like an incredible visionary um, and serial entrepreneur, which is just amazing. Um, but, you know, what's incredible about this particular business is it was founded on a mission. And, you know, there are inflection points in companies to where you could have a situation where people are lost, or you could have a situation where people are really grounded in that North Star. And um, I'm super proud of the team because through the grief, we all kind of came together to say like, hey, you know, our job is to fill her vision and her mission, you know, like, let's, let's make Lila proud. You know, she always, and actually she even wrote this in her book that she wanted her, her vision of giving work to outlast her by generations. And so we all took that to heart. Um, you know, despite the, uh, the personal grief really came together to, to see that through, because that's what she would uh, have cared about the most is uh, seeing this, this business be incredibly successful because success means, means impact. So yeah, that kind of brings us forward and Boy, um, you know, this, I, I realize this is a, a 20 plus minute podcast. We could talk a long time about COVID <laughs> and what happened after that, but it was shortly thereafter um, COVID hit. And so it's been a really, really um, interesting year, but I'm super proud of the team. We saw ourselves through a virtualization, which is really an interesting and kind of great feat in the um in, in light of COVID, especially working in local com communities. And yeah, we virtualized our, our workforce and um, kept putting energy into the platform. And, you know, now here we are. Um, I have now transitioned from being that interim position into um, a permanent position. Well, thank you uh, so much for sharing that, Wendy. And again, I recognize that there's a lot of, um, you know, gravity as well as kind of the experience and emotion that is connected to what you share. So again, I, I want to honor and, and respect what you what you share. So thank you. Um, you know, one of the things that you you mentioned that I think really kind of stood out is this notion of the fact that you know companies that are built to last truly are 
culture based or value based and then mission space. Uh, whereas certain corporations, it's the CEO, and once that CEO leaves, transitions, retires, you know the the, the organization starts to kind of flounder a little bit. They're kind of aimless. Uh, but here, it's it's wonderful to see the 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 unity and the cohesion that's come about because of the fact that there's been a clear mission statement, and if anything, it's become even more laser, laser focused, and it's given fuel to why. Uh, all of you do what you do on a daily basis. So I think that that is a, a great message to take away. And again, uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I know this transition, um, the loss, your role, as well as COVID has been very challenging, but we're very excited to hear kind of the, the future chapters to be, to be written. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, <clears throat> this notion of, you know, lifting uh, some of the marginalized people out of poverty. I think uh, your team shared that some 50% of the company's workforce are female. Um, so if you could talk a little bit about who are they, uh, what is the kind of work that they're doing in terms of, you know, the structured data tagging aspects uh, to, to train the data and, and, and how has this actually changed our lives? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, We've actually kept our mission focus since founding, and uh, the target was um, so the World Bank has a poverty line standard, which is people who make less than two dollars a day. That's their kind of global standard for people living in poverty. So that's really where we started with our demographic. Um, we launched um, targeting uh, women and youth in the slums of Nairobi because those particular populations have the greatest barriers to an employ to um, employment. And so these are not folks that are sort of, you know, middle class, college educated. We are talking about people whose household incomes, you know, equate to less than two dollars a day, um, you know, graduated, you know, high school, extremely, extremely bright, but don't necessarily have all the funds to get themselves into both university or you know, sort of the the cachet to to uh, get into jobs. Um, so we found that those were the areas that we wanted to target, and we extended that to other areas. So we also have locations in um, in uh, Uganda, in rural Uganda, as well as urban Uganda, and, as well as India. Um, so that's how uh, we targeted people. We worked in community to um, provide specific digital skills training, and then the model is the the purposeful hiring is is that's the qualification. Um, now, obviously, everything we do is performance driven, so people have to have the motivation to come in and, and sort of put in the work. Uh, but what we found is that um, coming through our training programs, we have, you know, 99 plus percent uh, graduation rate. And, you know, these jobs are incredibly meaningful because we are, uh, are providing living wages. So... Uh, coming in uh, to the program, uh, they go through the training. Uh, we provide, you know, very specific uh, image annotation and data labeling training on our platform. So it's technical skills, soft skills, et cetera. And um, as they come in and, and, and do the work, we have a platform. So, I mean, in, in machine learning, and our, our platform has machine learning in it. <laughs> so what we want is that we want the uh, machines to do as much lifting as possible, and then the humans to do that work that is uniquely human. And if you're you know, familiar, um, of course, with um, supervised machine learning and you know, artificial intelligence models, um, quality is really difficult without human context. So many things can be automated, but it's kind of that last mile of quality that's so critical that oftentimes requires human context. So we built a platform that could automate, automate as much as possible and then is really tuned to um, getting the most value out of the human annotation. So that's basically what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, what is really interesting, though, is that because these jobs are so meaningful, uh, our retention rates are through the roof. So we have, I mean, traditionally in this kind of space, you could have anywhere upwards of 150% annualized attrition. We sit around 10 or 11%. Um, on average. And so what happens is that we have annotation experts. These are, are people who can quality sure your, your training data and the outputs of your machine learning models. Um, so that's a little bit about kind of what the journey looks like. In terms of 50% um, women, you know, 50% uh, men, that was actually an objective we had when we started the, the, um, the business as a whole. So it was something that Lila founded our core mission on. And that's because there are several studies that basically show that not only um, is it much harder to get a job as a woman, but when you employ women, the contributions to society and sort of the lift uh, that you see in the community is significant. So we start 
you know, by definition with equal pay. Uh, I think one of the things that I'm super proud of is we um, are sitting at 53% right now um, overall of our workforce being female. Um, and that extends all the way up through management. So we are, I mean, I'm, I'm female, but I mean, even through, even in our, uh, in our um, centers in Kenya, um, you know, like our top directors and staff are, are women as well. So um, we try to live that all the way through the uh, career path. Okay, and I think this is uh, consistent with the mission of the organization and what uh, Samasource has begun the, the nonprofit and that has transitioned into a for-profit. Um, the area that I do want to kind of explore a little bit is that uh, within, you know, machine learning, um, you know, there's, there's, you know, I saw an academic research that talked about um, just, you know, the fact that it's getting to a point where it's becoming, you know, too computationally intensive, too energy and computational heavy. Uh, but more importantly, others that are kind of starting to develop the fact that it's difficult to rely just on, you know, structured data and annotation by humans and that there are, you know, machines actually, whether it's adversary or different approaches, creating their own data sets or in some cases, it's actually not really creating data, but it's actually learning as it goes. Um, mm -hmm. So I guess the point I'm trying to make is, you know, taking a very simple example that maybe everyone can understand on, on, on that's listening to the podcast is, you know, we are thankful for new business models like the shared economy where Uber and Lyft allows for those that are underemployed or structurally unemployed to be able to actually have an opportunity to drive and earn income. However, uh, with the, the level four, level five, uh, you know, self-driving capabilities, we're going to start to shift away from those people being employed to be those people being displaced again. What's the issue here? And, and the model that you have, is that truly sustainable in the long future? Yeah, it's a great, a great question. And well, first off, you know, unsupervised machine learning techniques um, can address certain scenarios, but by far and large, when you get to highly complex use cases, and I mean, you used, you know, level four, level five autonomous vehicles as an example, um, there are so many complexities. Uh, everything from different sensor types like LiDAR to, you know, video and, you know, camera imaging, um, all the way to, you know, weather implications and a million different types of roads so the the to to get to a level of accuracy that's what i mean by quality accuracy of your training data to allow the model to operate properly um you cannot do that th purely through unsupervised learning there's you know if you kind of think about where we sort of are in the chasm or the adoption of machine learning this is still an incredibly early technology and it will be several years to come um, to, to where, like, we'll be at the singularity. If we don't need machine, you know, if machines can do it all, then then theoretically all AI is possible. So um, do we think humans, um, and do I think humans in the loop will be that context to get to those, you know, edge cases and, and complex scenarios is gonna be necessary um, for the next several years, um, absolutely. And creating impact along the way is what we wanna do. So this purposeful hiring model, we will continue to employ but what's going to happen is people's jobs are going to change over time. I actually see our humans in the loop uh, really moving, you know, definitely further up the value chain. Um, so the example I used before is that, uh, you know, we have a large number of engagements with clients where we are, you know, validating model outputs. You know, so we're, you know, I think what will happen in the human in the loop is that there's still a good amount of work being done on core labeling. I think that's really going to transition to the humans training the machines. It's it's really interesting um, in terms of what you're talking about because one of the areas that I, I foresee that can be very become very large is this notion of forensics. You know, because uh, there is a lot of demand for machine learning algorithms to become more transparent, we need a way to properly audit them. So, you know, from one result to another, you know, can we assume that the set of algorithms are behaving consistently, and how do we know that there's no bias? Uh, so, this notion of auditing transparency and forensics becomes very critical. And it's interesting because as your Kenyan team, as an example, start to build their core competency and move up the value chain, they could even very much be in a position of being the auditors or the validators or the tester of some of these outputs that they can trace back to the originating data sets. I wanna talk about data bias. Uh, data bias um, has been seen uh, in AI uh, whether it's academic research or private projects that's shown this kind of this inherent biasness in the algorithms because of the fundamental underlying data itself. Uh, mm -hmm. How are you guys training the data in such a way to account and to address some of these issues so that we can you know, handle some of these social issues as well as sustainability issues? 
Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. It's very true. Kind of uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? Um, so. Uh, a model itself, it's difficult for the model itself to be biased because the model just trains on the data that's in front of it. Is it possible for us to not have a complete set of data? Absolutely, right? I mean, that's exactly what we're trying to account for. And so there is, um, I think what's really interesting is is there's a lot of energy behind you know, uh, hiring, you know, uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers, one of the things that we always emphasize is that um, understanding your training data strategy is absolutely critical. Because if you don't start with the right you know, ingredients, if you will, you won't, you won't end up with the recipe you want. So one of the things that we do is we've invested quite a bit in our platform uh, relative to, to basically classify and understanding the data that's out there. And we have taken an approach just because we, we have both really strong retention, um, but we've, we've gone to develop expertise in a number of different industry verticals. AV is one of them, but there are several others, including, you know, e-commerce, um, you know, smart hardware, AR, VR, et cetera. And anyhow, with the information that we have and we're able to report upon, we can actually take a look at it. And using a, a very simple AV example, if you've got, you know, 100,000 miles of road and, um, you know, millions of cars, but like 50 motorcycles, that's a problem. <laughs> You're going to have a really, really hard time, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, with bias of against motorcycles, right? So um, that's a very you know modern example. There's uh, many obviously kinds of people and and uh, and skin color, but uh, that's exactly it. Is you need to not only understand the full scope of your universe of data, you need to understand rep, you know under representation, over representation, and if you don't have kind of a partner or solution that provides that visibility as well as the know-how and experience um, of how to to basically uh, both uh, address and correct for that, um, yeah, you'll end up with unintended consequences. So for those that are listening and trying to figure out the correlation between AI versus um, AI relative to climate change, you know, how does AI help mitigate or adapt or resolve climate change issues? Oh, wow. There are so many applications um, to uh, AI across so many. I mean, I, I truly, my personal belief is this is going to be the, the most disruptive technology towards solving a, a variety of different social issues, um, including climate change. So, uh, you know, the areas that we work in, in particular, um, are in uh, or where we spend a lot of focus is in computer vision. And so as an example, really managing um, whether it's like sustainable fisheries and being able to see where areas of the ocean are being, you know, over um, over uh, fished all the way to um, land management, um, as an example, to forestry conservation. Those are just some examples to where you can use computer vision based data to actually you know, um, massively improve and notify where there are there's over usage or over consumption of resources um, that would be incredibly difficult to do, you know, manually. No, agreed. I absolutely agree with that. Uh, I wish we had more time. Uh, I know we just started to kind of uh, scratch the surface a little bit. Uh, how can people learn more about uh, Samosource? Uh, best place is to come and visit us at our website, www.samosource.com. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, and uh, yeah, would would love to catch you more. This has been a lot of fun. Great. So with that, I've been joined by Wendy Gonzalez, who is the CEO of Samosource. Thank you for joining. Thanks, Scott. Have a great day. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.